Morning Sandals Church, man. I'm glad you guys are here today. I don't know if you guys like to read, but I'm addicted to reading and learning. And one of the things that fascinates me is NASA and all the billions of dollars that we spend on things that they do. And one of the things in America that we spend billions and billions of dollars on is listening. I don't know if you know this, but we have, we have all of these huge, huge microphones that are tuned into the universe listening. We send out signals and we're listening for signals. And this past week, NASA has announced for the first time in human history, we believe that we have recorded discernible sound coming back to us. And so once again, scientists are in a, in a frizzy all over the world asking this question, are we alone in the universe? When the Bible has said for thousands of years, no, no, you're not alone. And I want you to know that you're not alone, that you're not a cosmic accident, okay? Okay? There's no such thing as accidental children. There's just accidental parents. You are not an accident. You were planned by God. You were made by God. And you don't have to spend billions and billions of dollars to hear from God. God will listen to you for free. And we're going to talk today about how to get God to hear you because there's going to be a time in some of your lives where you need God to hear you. It could be, man, you don't know whether you're supposed to date or not, right? Big decision. You don't know if you're supposed to go to school or not. You don't know if you're supposed to you know, get married or not, have kids or not, take this job or not. There's gonna be times in your life where maybe it's a life or death situation and somebody that you love is sick or dying or dead and you need God and you need to hear from him. Okay, and this is, this is how to call 911 today and, and just know that God is gonna hear you. So I don't know where you are, but I want you to know this. No matter where you are, God hears you. No matter what you're going through, God hears you. And we're gonna talk today about how to amplify your voice to be assured that God hears your request in your time of need. So let's begin with a time of prayer and just ask God to bless your ears, my words, so we can hear his truth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the truth of who you are. God, we need to hear your words, and God, I know that you want to hear from us, and so I pray that today we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God, that you hear us. So teach us today, Lord, from your word, from Acts chapter 12, how to be heard by you. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So let's take a look at Acts 12, 1. The church needs to be heard by God. Two things are gonna happen today in the message. One of the most famous apostles in the gospels is killed. There's two really, really famous guys in the gospels. They're brothers. Their names are James and John. They got like WWW wrestling names. They're called the Sons of Thunder. Pretty cool, right? The Sons of Thunder, James and John. And they're excitable guys. When they go into a town and, and Jesus isn't received, they ask Jesus this, do you want us to bring lightning down from the sky and strike these people dead? These are the kind of people James and John are. Now, John, the younger brother, he'll mellow out as he gets older and he will live almost to 100 years old and he will write the gospel of John, first, second, and third John, and he defines himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. James is not going to live that long. James is beheaded 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ for his faith. And the church is going to respond to that. And the church is not, not only going to lose James, but they're afraid they're going to lose the apostle Peter whom Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so the church finds itself in a situation where they got to cry out to God and they need to be heard by God because all of a sudden, not only are Christians being persecuted, but the very apostles, the very foundations upon which the church is built, they're being killed and they need to be heard by God. So let's take a look at Acts 12 verse one. It says, at that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some of the believers in the church. He had the apostle James, that's John's brother, killed with the sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. Now let me give you a little quick history on why he would be so interested in pleasing the Jewish people. Here's the number one answer, Herod is not Jewish. He's not, he's from Greek ancestry and he is put in power, his family is put in power by first the Greek government and then the Roman government. Now, Herod comes from a long line of Herods. This is not the same Herod who killed all the little babies in Bethlehem. That's his grandpa. His grandpa was a nasty dude. So nasty that his grandpa killed his dad, okay? Literally when he was seven years old. So this Herod and his mother fled to Rome and he went to elementary school in Rome. 
And he grew up with a little guy in elementary school named Claudio, and Claudio eventually became the Roman emperor. Now, Herod didn't do so well in life. He was a womanizer. He was bad with money. He struggled in life. He was an idiot, but he had a good friend named Emperor Claudius, right? And so Emperor Claudius puts him in power and makes him king over Israel. And you can imagine, you think our candidates for president are knuckleheads. You can imagine if, you know, Britain just sent somebody they wanted off the island to rule us, right? And that's what happens. And so he comes over. So he's not Jewish. He's an idiot. The Jews don't like him. And so he discovers, hey, this makes them excited. Now, let me say this. The Bible is not anti-Jewish. And unfortunately, throughout history, Christians have read this passage and become anti-Semites. They've become racists against Jews. You need to remember, Jesus is a Jew. The 12 apostles are Jew. The vast majorities of Christians at this point are Jews. This is a schism in the Jewish community. They do not represent all Jews, okay? Just like Democrats don't represent all Americans and neither do Republicans. There's a political schism. And so there's a group of Jews that do not like what's happening in Christianity. They cannot stand it and they want it shut down. And so, like a lot of politicians, Herod sees political opportunity. And so he seizes it and he kills James and they get excited. And he says, okay, we'll have Peter arrested too. And I'm going to kill him as well. The problem is it's Passover. Now, most Christians do not celebrate Passover because we now call it Easter, Jesus Christ dies on Easter weekend and he's raised from the dead when Passover is over on Sunday morning. And we remember the resurrection during the Passover weekend. And so we celebrate it not as Passover, but as Easter because Christ rose from the dead. But it's the most famous Jewish holiday. And so they're celebrating the holiday weekend. And so Herod can't kill, you know, Peter on Christmas weekend or Easter weekend. And he says, I'll wait till Monday and I'll kill him. So until that time, check this out. He says, throw him in prison. Look at verse four. He imprisoned him and he placed him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Okay. Now Taylor Swift fans, she didn't invent the term squad. Squad means four. So four squads means 16 soldiers. Why would he put 16 soldiers around Peter? If you don't know your Christian history, Christians can get a little slippery when arrested and or crucified and placed in a tomb. So you wanna make sure that they stay where they are because sometimes even killing them isn't enough to keep them where they need to be. And so, right, he wants to make sure that Peter stays where he stays. So he gives 16 guards to watch over Peter so that he can kill him on Monday. And by the way, if you're a guard under Roman law, if your prisoner escaped, you as the guard suffered whatever penalty they were going to suffer. So these 16 guards are motivated to make sure that Peter dies on Monday morning. So he intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Verse five, but while Peter was in prison, the church, underline this, prayed very earnestly for him. They prayed very earnestly for him. So isn't this interesting? James is dead. He's beheaded. The Bible doesn't say anything about mourning for James. It doesn't say anything about preparing for burial for James. The church doesn't mourn whatsoever for one of their most charismatic, dynamic leaders. The church rallies together, not for the person who's dead, but for the person who still has a chance at life. I want you to notice here that the church doesn't rally together and worry. Any professional worriers in here? Your spiritual gift, right? I'm a worrier. I am so good at worrying. I do. The church doesn't worry. What they do is they pray. They go to God because they understand this is out of their hands. They understand that they need God. They understand that without God, Peter's dead. This is over. And it's so sad and so tragic in life that many of us as Christians, the very last thing we think to do is pray. Now this weekend, college football opened up, okay? I'm a Trojan fan, difficult weekend this weekend. Clearly our team is possessed by something. I don't know what's going on, but do you know that at the end of the game, when you're in absolute desperation and you have to win, they throw a pass and it's called a what? Does anybody know what it is? It's called a Hail Mary. Think about this. What that means is you have no chance whatsoever and so you're gonna cry out to God and throw a pass and hope he answers. Wouldn't it be better to pray before the game? Maybe pray during the game. Maybe repent at halftime, confess your sins, rededicate everyone's life to the Lord. Maybe the third quarter, the fourth quarter. But what is it about the last play of the game where we say, God, we need you? That's just the way we are as human beings. 
We work through every single process. Some of you, your marriages need a Hail Mary, but no, nope, first thing you're gonna do is see a lawyer, because those are helpful. Next thing you're gonna do is maybe you'll see a counselor, that might be helpful. You know, next thing you're gonna do, you're gonna talk to friends on Facebook. The last thing you're gonna do is pray. And that's so tragic and so sad. And I want you to see here that the church rushes together to pray because Peter needs help. Now, this is where the story just gets fantastic. And if you're new to Christianity or you don't know your Bibles that well, it's gonna feel like an episode of Harry Potter. But I assure you, this is what happened because magic may not be real, but God is. And God moves and God does amazing things. Verse six, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep. Any, would anybody sleep through the night, the night before you're gonna be beheaded? Okay, I can't even sleep on airplanes. I went to India last month, and as we flew over the nation of Iran, it was in the middle of the night, I was awake the whole night, simply staring at the video screen in front of me with a picture of our plane represented as a dot as we flew over Iran. Why? Because the Persians are a little nutty. Unless, of course, you're Persian, I'm glad you're here, but your relatives make me nervous. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I got some crazy relatives too. So welcome Iranians, I'm glad you're here. But the whole time, man, I'm like, oh my gosh, we're gonna get shot down, we're gonna get shot down, we're gonna get shot down. I am a worry wart, man, okay? That is my spiritual gift. The only person that worries more than me is my wife. She worries about my worrying. That's, that's where she is. Notice, Peter's asleep. He's on some like Messiah melatonin. I don't know what it is, but he's like, I gotta get a good night's sleep. I'm gonna be beheaded tomorrow. So he just goes to bed. It's interesting. This is the same guy who would later write in his letters known as 1 Peter and 2 Peter, he says, cast all your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. Amen. Everything you're worrying about, this guy says, throw it to God and take a sleep, take a nap, conk out. Man, I, I can't even sleep in the car, I can't sleep on planes. Peter's gonna be beheaded the next day and he's, a, he's asleep. But it gets even worse. The night before Peter was placed on trial, he was asleep, underline this, fastened with two chains, okay, with two chains between two soldiers. Guys, ever been to a men's retreat? Sleeping in the room with other men is almost impossible. Men sleep like bears. They wrestle things in their sleep. It's bizarre. Not only is he in the room with other guys, but he is chained to them. That's awkward unless you're into that and we have counseling for you. It's bizarre, right? Okay, I would not sleep well chained to two men in a prison cell at night, you know, in a hole. What's Peter doing? He's like, I'm out and he's just sleeping while these two soldiers are chained to him. Once again, why? Because Christians have a habit of escaping. So other guards stood guard at the prison gate. Verse seven, suddenly there's a bright light in the cell. Okay, this is the way angels appear, man. It's glorious, a messenger from heaven. It's like literally the brightest light you've ever seen appearing in this darkness. But the angel shows up, glorious, and Peter's like, <laughs> I mean, he's unmoved, absolutely unmoved. Don't you wish you could sleep like Peter? I mean, this would be amazing. Chained between two dudes, an angel's in the cell, right? It's crowded, it's crazy. Peter's snoring. There's a bright light in the cell, and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. Underline these words, no one knows exactly how to translate this. It says, the angel struck him. He may have kicked him. Hey, hey, God is in your midst. Wake up, knucklehead. I mean, he has to strike. Can you think that you sleep that deep that an angel is standing before you and they're kicking you? Get up, get up. I mean, this is like a teenager on Monday morning trying to get up for school. I mean, nothing can wake this person. It's like they're dead. Come on, get up, get up, get up. So he struck in him to awaken. And he said, quick, get up and the chains fell off his wrists. And then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. Okay, why? Because we can't have a naked apostle run around the streets. He's like, get some clothes on, which is just bizarre. I would have remained clothed if chained between two men. That's just me. Maybe he didn't have an option, right? Maybe he didn't have an option. But the angel says, get your clothes on, put on your sandals. And he did. He says, now put on your coat, right? I mean, it's like Peter's too. Put your shoes on, now your shirt, now your coat. You know, the angel is totally irritated at this point. And he says, now follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel, underline this, but all the time he thought it was a vision. Anybody ever had a dream that was so real, so incredibly real that when you wake up, you're like, oh God, thank God. Oh. Anybody had that dream, just me? 
Anybody ever have a dream that your spouse cheated? Yeah, I have that dream. I wake up and I just wait for Tammy. Get up, no, get up, get up. We're gonna talk about what you did, right? She wakes up, she's like, what? I'm like, well, we're gonna talk about what? One night, man, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had a dream somebody was trying to get in our bedroom. Our bedroom door opens to the outside of our house or one of the bedrooms does. And I wake up and I realize it's not a dream. Somebody's rattling the door. Yeah, I freak out. So I jump out of bed, ready to pounce with all of my manliness. And I realize someone's not trying to get in our bedroom. Someone's trying to escape our bedroom. And it's my wife. She's sleepwalking and she's at the door and she's rattling the door and I go, what are you doing? And she's like, I gotta get out of here. I'm like, why? She's like, there's a bad man in here. I'm the bad man. And you know why that is? Listen to me, ladies, listen to me. This is free, this isn't in the message, okay? My wife watches Lifetime TV where all these people get murdered in weird ways And you know who it is? It's always the husband. The husband always does it. I come into the bedroom 10, 10, 30 at night. My wife's wrapped up in her, you know, I don't know who did it. I go, I know, it was the guy. Now sleep tight, (laughs) you know? And then in the middle of the night, she's like, I gotta get out of here. Okay. So sometimes, right, we have dreams that seem so real, we're thankful when we wake up. We're like, oh, so Peter's not sure, you know? I mean, this is a bizarre night. It's not every night that you go to sleep chained between two dudes in a prison cell. This is a new experience for him. So he's not quite sure what's happening. But he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. So they passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. I mean, the angels just literally, somehow God has put a sleep over everyone and nobody can wake up and he's just leading Peter out. Check this out. He led him to the gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. Isn't that cool? God just like, and it opens. And suddenly the angel left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The angel of the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and all that the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. This is the guy who wrote the gospel of Mark, who traveled with the apostle Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts. He says, he went to his house where many there had gathered for prayer. Why are they there praying in the middle of the night? They're praying for Peter to be released. So he goes there and he knocked on the door of the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. Now I wanna meet Rhoda in heaven and I'm gonna tease her for all eternity, okay? Because here's Rhoda, they're all praying, right? For Peter to be released. Peter shows up, knocks on the door. Rhoda goes to the door to answer it, sees that it's Peter. Ah, she's so excited. She runs and leaves Peter standing outside right? She freaks out. She freaks out. She runs and she tells everyone inside, Peter is standing at the door. Listen to all these super spiritual Christians. Verse 15, you're crazy. See, see many times when we're asking for a miracle, we are so in the business of not expecting to move. We're so shocked when he does move, we can't even acknowledge it. How sad is that? You're out of your mind. You're crazy. You know what? Let me translate this for you. It's too late. That's stage four cancer. God couldn't do a miracle. They have brain damage, God can't bring them back. Oh, that marriage is over, it's done with, it's finished. God could never revive that love. Oh, you're financially wrecked forever. This is what we tell ourselves, you are out of your mind. God can't help your situation. Guess what? He did. You're out of your mind. When she insisted, they decided, well, it must be his angel. We would say this, it this way. Well, it's his ghost. So you know what they're saying? Not only are you wrong, but apparently Peter's been killed in prison and this is just his ghost waving to us on his way to heaven. Bye. These are Christians, people of faith. This is who changed the world, okay? They have doubts just like you do, just like I do. Meanwhile, where's Peter? He's still outside. Hey guys, hey, I'm Peter, the apostle. Let me in. When they finally opened the door, they saw him and they were, circle these words, amazed, amazed. So let's talk about how to get God to hear you. Number one, God hears me when I recognize my need for God enough to vocalize it. Now, some of you have studied anthropology. Anthropology is the study of humans. And one of the things that just boggles anthropologists' minds is how did human beings learn to speak? You know how you learn to speak? You learn to speak because your parents spoke to you. 
Language is something that we learn when it is spoken to us by someone else. So here's the question, right? It's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Who learned to speak first? Someone had to speak to us. The Bible says God spoke to you. Why would God teach us to speak? The answer is, he wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear your voice. I gotta recognize God, my need for God, enough to vocalize it. Some of you will say this, and you're a Christian, you're super spiritual, you're like, well, God already knows what I need, so I don't have to ask. Listen to what James says. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't ask. God wants to hear your voice, your voice, your request. Now we have some missionaries from Sandals who are are back here for the summer and they've been staying with some people in our church and we've got the opportunity to have them with us for the last two weeks and they got little kids. And um, this weekend, my wife and I, we sent both of our girls off to college and I'm just really, really sad and bummed, uh, you know, and I miss my, I'm incredibly happy for my girls that they're in college, but I'm also deeply sad. And so uh, our, our friends have two little boys and they have one little girl and I just am falling in love with her. She's two and she is the cutest thing you've ever seen. And so the other night I'm in bed and I hear this little voice, this little voice crying from somewhere in our house, okay? And uh, she's so cute, she's manipulative, right? She gets what she wants. And I'm completely destroying her parents' parenting because I'll give her whatever she wants because she's awesome. And um, I hear this voice in the middle of our house in the dark. Daddy, daddy, I'm in the dark. And I'm like, I will come save you when I get on my horse and I'm riding through the house. I will save you, right? Her dad doesn't care, but I care right? No, he was outside counseling another member in our church, you know, doing the Lord's work while I was sleeping. And, um, but I go, you know, and I'm trying to find her. And I just thought, what a great picture, man. What a great picture of us with God. I'm not even her dad and I care about her. Your father in heaven is your father and he cares about your voice. And he's waiting for you to acknowledge you're in the dark and you need his help. Say, God, Daddy, my my marriage is in the dark. My finances are in the dark. The doctor says my life is in the dark. And God will come to you and he will listen to you and he will hear you, but he's waiting for you to speak it. He's waiting for you to use your words, right? What do we tell children? Use your words, use your words. Why do we say that? Because we want our children to learn to communicate with us. Psalm 77, one says this, I cry out to God. Yes, I shout that God would listen to me. You know, there's something happening in America that's quite embarrassing for us as Christians. In America today, all across the United States, Fortune 500 companies are building rooms in their offices for Muslims to pray. Did you know that? Do you know why companies are building rooms for Muslims to pray during the day? Because they demand it. How sad is it that us as Christians have never ever asked, hey, I need a place to pray. Now, we got a place to smoke, but we don't have a place to pray. Think about how different your work environment would be if people knew that periodically throughout the day you stopped to pray. Think about how different your work environment, your house, your home, your family life would be if people knew you were praying. Think about that. Just take, and you don't have to pray forever. The Lord's Prayer takes 15 seconds to say. 15 seconds, why, why would God teach us to pray in 15 second inter, in increments? Because he knows we have ADD, he knows it. You don't have to pray forever, but you do need to pray. And you need to go before God and say, God, I need you. So let's talk about barriers to crying out to God. First one, your fear, you're afraid. You're afraid of being embarrassed. You're afraid God won't hear you. You're afraid it won't work. So those are the three fears. I'm afraid that God won't hear me. I'm afraid people will make fun of me. I'm afraid it won't work. And why is that? Because we've all had a James in our life. We've all seen somebody die. We've all had an experience where we prayed for our marriage and it didn't work. We prayed for our finances and we went bankrupt. We prayed for someone to survive cancer and they died. And you know what's so tragic? We stopped praying because we're afraid. I want you to notice here that James is dead but the church still prays. The church still prays. And here's what's so sad. Some of you don't pray for your second marriage because you say it didn't work in my first marriage. Some of you don't pray for your second child because you say it didn't work for my first. Some of you say, well, I'm not gonna pray for my finances or my job because last time I prayed and I got fired. How silly is that? You know what you're saying is, as a Christian, your life is hopeless. 
Thank God the church didn't say, well, you know what, James died, so it's in God's hands. They knew it was in God's hands, but you know what they did? They still prayed. They prayed for the release of Peter and they experienced a miracle. How sad would that be if you're missing out on a miracle because you didn't get what you wanted one time or it didn't work out the way you thought it would and so you never asked God again? Do you know how many people I meet that are that way? Well, I prayed once. I prayed once and it didn't work. We're gonna talk to you about that at the very end, but I just want you to know you gotta move through your fear. Look at this verse, Psalms 42, three. Day and night I have only tears for food while my enemies continually taunt me saying, where is this God of yours? You know what the psalmist is saying? He's afraid his prayers aren't working. That's in the Bible. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist is praying, saying, God, I don't think this works. Where are you? We got to move past that because God is there. Next, my pride. My pride keeps me from praying. And I want to speak to the men. Some of you are like, you know what? You, you, you just believe you can do it on your own. I can fix my marriage. Really? How did it get where it is? I can fix my finances. I can pick myself up by my bootstraps. About a year ago, man, you know, I, I love my son, but he can be a little bit prideful. I don't know where he gets that from, right? It's his mother. No, it's me. It's me. And we went snowboarding. Anybody ever been snowboarding or skiing? Okay. And if you've never been like snowboarding, basically trying to get on one of those boots is like, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it takes a rocket scientist to figure out how to get them on. And then the shoelaces require an ox and a mule to pull so that you can get them as tight as they need to be. And my son's a little guy and he's sitting there and he's working on it and he can't do it. And I'm just waiting. I'm just staring at him. You need help? He's like, no. I'm like, you need help? He's like, no, I can do it on my own. I'm like, you know, there's really nice, beautiful snow outside and we've paid a lot of money and we would all like to get on the mountain. He's like, I got it on my own. And finally, he's like, fine, you can help me. And then I'm like, no. <laughs> but you know, that's how we are. Some of us are like a little boy. I can do it on my own. Fine, God, help me. Save my marriage. Fix my finances. Right? And God's like, oh, thanks for asking. Listen to what the Bible says. If my people, and you have to decide, are you God's person? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You know the number one reason people don't believe in God? It's not because they lack faith. It's because they're prideful. That's why. They don't want to admit they need God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. This, this is a promise. If you humble yourself, God says, I'll hear you from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. Let me translate this. I'll bring healing. I'll bring healing if you would just humble yourself. But there's two parts. So my fear keeps me from praying, my pride, and then my sin. So let's read that verse again. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You know why many of you won't ask God for help? Because you don't want God to change your life. You don't want to ask God into your relationship because you know there's sin in your relationship. You don't want to ask God into your finances because you know you don't honor God with your finances. You don't want to ask God to intervene in your business because your business doesn't honor God and you won't repent of your sins. God says, humble yourself, ask for help, and oh, by the way, repent of your wickedness. And here's the beauty. He says, then I'll restore unto you what you need. Now, here's the good news. As Christians, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how you've blown it. It doesn't matter how badly you've sinned. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sins. And the Bible says we can come boldly before the throne of God in our time of need because of Jesus. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. Yeah, you're a screw up. You're welcome. You know, we're all screw ups. We're all idiots. We've all blown it. We've all blown it. Number two. You want to hear from God? Then I must rally others who love Jesus to my cause. 1 Kings 13, 6. This is the King Jeroboam. He's king of the northern tribes of Israel. He says, and the king said, underline this, to the man of God. Where did he go? To the man of God. He says, entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and what? Pray for me. Why is it that we're all so afraid to ask for others to pray for us? Some of you, wives, you haven't told your husband what's on your heart. You haven't invited him to pray with you. Some of you, you, have, you know, you're single, you got best friends, you haven't told anybody what's going on. 
Some of you are students, you haven't told your parents, you haven't invited other people to pray with you. Why are you doing that? Listen, when other people pray with you, it amplifies your voice to God. Now it's not just one child crying out, but his children are crying out. And the Bible says God hears us. God hears us. Let me tell you something, man. The past month, my wife got so irritated with me, and let me tell you why. Because I went to India and I haven't been able to go to the bathroom right for a month. Okay, this is what she told me. She says, I, I need you to do something for me. I said, what, babe? She says, I need you to stop talking about poop. Stop talking about poop. Stop telling people about poop. It's embarrassing. I need you to stop. I said, I'm gonna tell everyone about my poop until God heals me, okay? <laughs> literally, until God heals me. I had a woman, a random woman, literally lay hands on my belly and started praying for me. And my daughter was like, is that awkward? I was like, who cares? Who cares, okay? I want healing. I want healing. I want it better, right? I want to have a bowel movement for Jesus. That's what I want to have. Why do I tell everybody? Because I wanna be healed. I wanna be healed. Is poop embarrassing? Yes. I was talking with somebody else. I said, yeah, I had to go give a poop sample. That's fun. Go to the hospital. Hey, I'm here to drop off something. You want this? And the nurses are like, ah, oh, put that over there with that guy. I got some feces from India. Yeah, ooh. my wife's like, you're disgusting. I'm like, no, I'm spiritual. <laughs> spiritual. You know, this weekend, in a, in on a serious note, I had a friend of mine who called me on the phone because his wife left him. And as we're talking on the phone, I, I said, where did this come from? How did this happen? He said, oh, she told me six months ago she was thinking about leaving. I said, six months ago? Why are you calling me now? You know what he said? I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. Least, listen, it's a whole lot easier to pray for somebody when they're sick than to pray that God brings them back from the dead. So why don't you pray before the marriage is dead? Why don't you pray? And you know why that is? Because we don't want to share our crap. See what I did there? Poop story, crap, brought it all back. It's a master communicator right there. You'll appreciate that on the way home. All right. Simon said, pray for me. Ephesians 6, 19. This is the Apostle Paul, wrote half the New Testament. Underline these words. Pray for me. Pray for me. While Peter was in prison, the church prayed. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ... On the night that he was crucified, he asked the disciples to do two things. First one, watch. You know what that means? Stay awake. How'd they do? <laughs> Not good. Remember, Peter has sleeping issues. He says, watch, and guess what? Pray. Let me ask you this question. If Jesus Christ, when he was tempted, needed prayer, how about you? How about you? Are you Jesus? Are you more holy than Jesus? Are you more spiritual than Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think so. And here's the thing, man. Religion makes us embarrassed. And we don't share what's really going on. You know, Mother Teresa is probably one of the most famous Christians of the last 50 years. And after she died, what we began to learn about her in her journals was her struggles with faith. How sad is it that a person as spiritual and as faithful and as lovely as Mother Teresa, how sad is it that she felt that she could never tell anybody how she struggled? Even people as spiritual as Mother Teresa fail to follow Jesus in requesting prayer. Would you pray for me? Here's a woman who spent her whole life for others when in reality we know for decades she was lonely and needed people to pray for her. You ain't Mother Teresa, and you're certainly not Jesus. Ask people to pray for your finances. If you're struggling with anxiety, depression, if you're battling lust, sex addiction, whatever it is, look, ask people to pray for you. Get as many people to pray for you as you can. That's why you need to be in a small group. That's why you need to be in a community group where you say, you know what? Our marriage isn't great. I got news for you. Lots of marriages aren't great. Lots of marriages. Lots of people have crazy kids. Look around. I need to pray for my kids. Why? There's a devil. You're like, no, your son can't be the devil because my son is the devil. And you can pray together. And pray for your crazy kids. Pray for your finances. Pray for your stress. And we got to learn to do this because it's amplifying our prayers to God. Last point. I must prepare myself for his answer and not my own. Now, I, I love my kids and, and they're fantastic, but sometimes they fail. I know that's hard for you to understand. But this last week, my, my son had a major, major failure. 
he talked to his mother in a way that made me want to send him to Jesus, <laughs> right? It's like, God, he's your son. I'm going to send him your way so you can heal him. My son was so mouthy, so mouthy to his mother that one of his sisters, okay, growing up with sisters who love Jesus is dangerous. One of his sisters got in his face and his sister made him write all of Proverbs 31 out in a letter of apology to his mother because Proverbs 31 ends with these words, her children will rise up and call her blessed. Amen, yeah. I came home and you know what I told him? I said, it's a good thing you wrote out that scripture because I was gonna bless you with these hands. <laughs> you know what happened to my son? My son temporarily forgot who's in charge. See, he is a 13-year-old young man, all-knowing, <laughs> thought he was the parent, and he spoke to his mother in a way where he forgot who he was talking to. You know, as Christians, we need to remember who the parent is, and it's God. And I got news for you. So here's the question. Don't send this question in the debrief. Why did God let James die and save Peter? You know what the answer is? I don't know. He does, God doesn't consult me. Hey, Matt, you know, I was thinking. I was thinking. I mean, that's what politicians do, right? Politicians get test groups in. They bring everybody in. You know, how does a Hispanic feel? How does a black person feel? How does a white person feel? And that's why we get these fake people. God doesn't do that. God makes the decisions that are the right decisions and they may not make sense now, but one day we know that they will be right. Psalms 52, excuse me, 57.2, I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. What is God going to do? God is going to fulfill his purpose for me. So God's purpose for James was over. God's purpose for Peter was not. James' time was up, Peter's wasn't. It doesn't make sense, it's not fair. They both followed. Look, man, I don't know why some people live and some people die, but I know this, God calls me to pray upon him because sometimes he will intervene and he will change something miraculously. He doesn't promise that he will always do it. Job, who probably suffered more than anybody, said this. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I have, and the Lord has taken it away. Do you know what happened to Job? He lost everything. His kids died, his animals died, his house got knocked down, his wife, his encourager, his partner said, curse God and die. <laughs> Anybody been in that marriage? Right? Curse God and die. That was her advice. This is what, God, this is what Job said. The Lord gave, and the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Because God's good. God is good. Look, it may not work out the way you think it's supposed to work out now, but God will fix it in the end. And I'm gonna close with this thought. Man, we, 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 we had a family lose a two and a half year old a couple weeks ago at Sandals Church to cancer. It was rough. I went over there, I got to meet with the family. It broke my heart, broke my heart to watch their little girl suffer so bad. In the Bible, King David of Israel loses a son to Bathsheba. Bathsheba is, eventually becomes his wife, but she's not at that point, but they lose a son. Did you, listen to this. David refuses to eat while the baby's sick. David refuses to be comforted. He refuses to bathe. He doesn't put on clothes. He prays to God night and day for his son to be healed. His son dies. Do you know what David does? He takes a bath. He eats a meal and he celebrates. And everyone in the kingdom goes, what is wrong with our king? You know what David says? He says this, while my son was alive, I prayed for his health. Now that he's gone, I know he's with the Lord and I will join him one day. I will see my son again and God will make it right. Listen, you may not get what you want now, but in Christ, the Bible says, God will restore all things to us. David says, I'm gonna see my son again. I'm gonna hold my son again and he trusts in God. Why? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you want God to hear you, he needs to know that you know he's God. And he needs to know you know you're you. We cry out, we pray, we ask, but in the end, God decides. And that's worship. God isn't just good when we get what we want. God is good even when the answer is no. Listen, Sandals Church, we need to be a praying church. The world needs Christians that are committed to prayer. Your families 
need you to be committed to prayer. Our community needs us to be committed to prayer. And we need to go to God and we need to cry out to God because we, he know, we know that he says he hears us. The blessing of prayer is not that you get what you want. The blessing of prayer is that God hears your request. He hears you. He hears you. He listens to what you need. And you are so blessed. You're so blessed. Call the Oval Office. See if Obama will take your request. Good guy, but he's not going to listen to you. God does. God does. Your great and mighty king in heaven listens when you call. He hears you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we are so thankful that you hear us when we pray and when we cry. God, I don't know what people are going through, but right now, wherever they are, I pray that they would cry out to you, that they would call upon you. Lord, regardless of their fear, their pride, their sin, whatever it is that they need to work through, God, right now, if they need prayer for their marriage, if they need prayer for relationships, something emotional that they're going through, their finances, whatever it is, God, I pray that they would just call out to you and say, God, I need you in this situation. And God, we know that you will hear us. Father, I pray also that we would have the courage to get in community groups and to share with others what it is that we need. God, our prayers are more powerful when we pray together. Help us have the confidence to do this. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.